All right, let's get started with session two. Um, just gonna run over the announcements once more. Um, so just so everyone knows, we are recording these sessions. Um, a reminder to everyone to mute themselves and turn off their video when they're not presenting, um, just so we have good connection and good quality videos. Um, and a quick note to presenters, I will give you um, time updates in the chat um your presentations should be three to five minutes and um the judge question session afterwards will be three to five minutes as well so in this session i apologize if i pronounce your names wrong but we'll start with um vinicius um then we'll go on to radika um noe and then henry at the end um so Let's start off with our first presenter. All right, you should be good to go whenever you're ready. All right, thank you very much. So, hello, my name is Vinny Taguchi, and I'm here to talk about um, green stormwater infrastructure and some of the unintended consequences that come if we don't go through the planning process uh, properly. Uh, next slide, please. So, when I talk about green infrastructure, what do I mean? So here in Minneapolis, we don't have to look any further than Nicolette Mall, and we can see there's a lot of uh, permeable pavements and trees and native prairie uh, habitat. And we see that this green infrastructure mixed in with our gray conventional infrastructure offers a lot of services. It can clean up the air quality, it can uh, provide habitat for native species, and it's just all around good. Uh, next slide, please. So the focus of my talk is on green stormwater infrastructure. So that's one kind of green infrastructure that manages urban stormwater to uh, improve water quality and prevent flooding. And here's one example, which is a rain garden, pretty common here in Minnesota. Uh, next slide, please. So why do we care about uh, stormwater? Well, the water that falls out of the sky is pretty clean, but once it picks up trash and chemicals and nutrients and heat and all kinds of fun things, uh, it's not really the kind of stuff we want to end up in our lakes, it's, uh, lakes and streams. So we have to manage it. Uh, next slide, please. But it's not easy being green. And I really can't thank Kermit enough for being such an avid spokesperson on this important issue. Next slide, please. Um, in the context of sustainability, we often talk about green infrastructure just looking at environmental sustainability, what's it doing for the environment, but also economic sustainability, what can this do for raising the values of our homes and buildings and cities. But as an engineer, uh, I don't often hear people talking about social sustainability. What does this mean for society as a whole? Next slide, please. So one thing we did was to create this visualization of how does green infrastructure uh, in the center here you'd see like a rain garden how does that interact with the rest of the urban environment so you can imagine with these arrows how the water and pollution that it carries might flow between natural areas and more developed areas and interact with them in different ways next slide please so to visualize those interactions in a real world situation i thought we would look at the highline project in new york city Next slide, please. So the High Line is an abandoned railroad line that goes through down uh, the heart of New York City, and it's been transformed into this long, beautiful park. So that's pretty exciting. It's uh, making use of wasted space. It's beautifying the city. It's providing some much needed greenery in the concrete jungle. Next slide, please. But as a stormwater engineer, the first place my mind goes is, Okay, this is a park, but it's up in the air, right? So it's kind of like a, a green roof. And 
What makes a green roof different from the rain garden that we saw before is since it's up in the air, the water that falls into it can't sink into the ground. It's going to pick up nutrients from this lush vegetated garden bed and whatever extra water there is that can't be held by the soil is going to drain off in the gutter. And the water will pick up a lot more nutrients than it had when it fell out of the sky, which is great for plants. It allows the plants to grow. But if the water full of nutrients falls into a lake or a stream, um, then we have algae growing, like uh, Siani was talking about in the previous session. And we don't want all of our lakes turning green. Uh, so next slide, please. So that's an example of the environmental sustainability that we can consider for this project. Um, now looking at economic sustainability. Well, if we look at how people interact with the High Line, we see that it seems like a thriving community, people coming, taking pictures, a lot of very attractive new development. Um, so economic sustainability seems good. The city's clearly uh, getting a payoff on its investment. Next slide, please. But if we look at the broader context, we can see some issues with the social sustainability. So this is a former industrial area with a lot of abandoned buildings and low rents. And the people who could afford to live in this neighborhood before can't necessarily afford to live in the neighborhood that we were just looking at. The problem is that it's the same neighborhood. So as an engineer, I wanna make sure that when I'm helping to make a neighborhood healthier, the people that I'm trying to help can still live there when I'm done. Next slide, please. So what can we do? Um, clearly green infrastructure is great, but in order to make sure that it can be great for everyone, we need to be mindful of all three aspects of sustainability. So this is a decision-making framework we came up with that kind of probes some of the questions that you need to consider at every step of the green infrastructure planning process to make sure that you're having all the people at the table that need to be there, that the community is represented, and that you're taking care of all aspects. And you can find that and a lot of other helpful things in the paper that we published. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an open access paper made with a bunch of people from different disciplines that have to do with green infrastructure. And we hope that it can be a useful tool for urban planners um, and anyone who interacts with green infrastructure or sustainable development. Next slide, please. And that's where you can find it or email me uh, if you want some more information. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Do we have any questions from the judges? I, that's not where I thought you were going to go with that presentation. So I had different questions and now they don't seem relevant. <laughs> um, I'm happy but it, to hear your other questions too. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, it's more of a comment really, not a question, but it's really exciting to see somebody in civil engineering thinking about the, the economic disparities that could arise from making such beautiful improvements to an area. Um, and you're right, it isn't thought about as much as it should be. Um, so I just appreciate that and I will definitely be looking into your paper more. <laughs> Thank you. Do, you. do you think the issues of gentrification can be addressed solely, I mean, would they be addressed solely through, uh, how, many, how do I want to say this? Do you think gentrification is uh, solely an issue of design or would it require partnerships with other parts of the community that you were designing in? Thanks for your question. Um, so I won't pretend to be an expert on gentrification. Uh, I was fortunate to work with uh, two of the authors, co-authors on this paper, Bonnie Keeler and Mira Klein, who work at the uh, CREATE initiative at the Humphrey School on campus. And they recently put out a uh, gentrification, green gentrification toolkit that you can look up or I can direct you to if you send me an email. And yeah, it sounds like it's a very complicated issue we definitely need all of the relevant voices at the table. So it's not just an issue of keeping costs down, but also making sure that as, you know, we 
we don't want a neighborhood to not be invested in at all. We don't want it to uh, all the infrastructure to decay just to keep prices down. We still want it to grow and thrive, but it, that has to happen in a way that the residents want to see their community evolve. It has to become something for the people who are there and not just for people who are going to come in from outside. So yeah, it's a very complex issue that I certainly can't tackle as an engineer, but I recognize the role that I play in uh, causing it to happen if I'm not bringing these, these experts uh, to the table to help make sure we develop a project properly. Good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to our presenter and judges. Um, we're going to move on to Radhika's presentation next. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Radhika. Am I audible to everyone? Yep. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So today, I take great pleasure in introducing you to Kernza, a sustainable grain with unique benefits. Curious to know why I called it my immortal climate crusader? Come, listen to my story. Next slide, please. Think of everything you eat in a day. Bread, noodles, cookies, pasta, even beer. All of these are grain-based products. Grains are an indispensable part of our diet. They contribute to 70% of our total calories. But have you ever wondered how your grains are grown? Most annual grain crops are produced through conventional industrial agricultural practices, which are a major cause for global pollution triggering climate change. Next slide, please. By 2050, we will have additional 2 billion mouths to feed. If grains continue to be grown by current methods, Earth may not have the capacity and the resources to sustain adequate food production. So how exactly do we feed the world without destroying the planet? Next slide, please. The answer is perennial crops that grow massive root systems. They don't require to be replanted each year. They require no tilling and making large-scale agriculture more sustainable. Next slide, please. So here is intermediate wheat grass, a perennial grain crop, also known as Kernza, the first ever perennial plant being cultivated for human consumption. Kernza's 10 feet long roots collect the carbon from the atmosphere and store it into the soil. These massive roots are also very efficient at utilizing nitrogen, thus preventing the leaching of harmful nitrogenous compounds into water bodies, improving groundwater quality. Kernza also demands fewer economic investments, but contains more protein, fiber, and antioxidants than most cereals, including wheat. Next slide. So all that is great, but how do we commercialize this novel grain? Next slide. Kernza suffers from some functional challenges. Its high fiber content interferes with the gluten forming reaction thus making it deficient in a special class of gluten proteins that is required to give baked goods their textural characteristics. By employing processing strategies such as efficient refining techniques, we can improve Kernza flour quality. Next slide, please. One such method is tempering. Tempering is a critical pretreatment before milling of grains. It involves four major steps. Step A, altering the moisture content of the grains. Step B, incubating the grains at certain temperature and times. Step C, milling the grains to flour. Step D, separating the, the bran from the flour. My research aims to optimize the tempering conditions for Kernza by selecting the ideal moisture, time, and temperature variables that yield flour with the best physiochemical properties. Next slide, please. In this picture, the box on the left is a tempered sample and hence the sieve on the left contains more bran particles and is more efficiently refined in comparison to the controlled non-tempered sample on the right, proving that tempering toughens the bran and facilitates better separation. Next slide, please. 
So did tempering improve functionality? Oh yes, it very much did. Data indicates that tempered flour was able to form stronger gluten networks due to better separation and reduced interference by bran particles. Through tempering, we can produce refined kernza flour with attractive properties that will encourage industries to incorporate kernza into product lines for breads, noodles, etc., thus diversifying its product portfolio. Next slide, next slide please. The next step in my research would be to conduct confirmatory studies by baking delicious breads using refined tempered flour at the optimized conditions and evaluating the overall effect of tempering on the baking performance of Kernza flour. Next slide, please. So my main point is perennial crops like Kernza offer many environmental benefits that can help combat climate change and ensure that food continues to grow sustainably to feed a growing population. By applying the right processing technologies like tempering, we can commercialize them and integrate them into our food systems and our diets. To have a real impact, we need more farmers to plant perennial plants, which is possible only if we develop a supply chain and market for these unique grains. Next slide, please. So sustainable crops like Kernza act as our first line of defense against climate change. As the old saying goes, little drops make the mighty ocean. Each one of you can be a part of this solution by supporting and promoting climate beneficial foods like Kernza that help build a sustainable food system. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for listening to my stories and you may now ask your questions. You did a great job explaining kind of benefits and also some of the, the economics um, supply chain issues. So I, you kind of stole my questions that I was thinking of <laughs> throughout your session. And I'll just say thank you for references, the librarians. But <laughs> uh, yeah, give me a minute to think of something. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess two questions. So the after you've um, kind of laid out what the tempering process would be, do those tempering facilities already exist or um, under other refinement methods or would they um, need to be new facilities? Uh, so tempering is a process that exists for all grains, including wheat. But since this is a new grain, tempering has not been established for intermediate wheat grass. And it's not a complex process. Industries can integrate it into their production very easily. It's all about finding the right temperature, time, and the moisture that is going to give you a successful flour. Great. And then my other question um, is, does this grain exist anywhere already? Is it on the marketplace? Yes, it is. So General Mills and Pantagonia, both of them are making great products with Kernza. Please go out and try them. Uh, I believe General Mills has a cereal called Honey Toasted Kernza Flakes. And you have the long root ale beer by Pantagonia. They're really tasty. It's like helping the planet has never been tastier, trust me. <laughs> Great, thank you. This is a silly question. Again, I'm not a food scientist. Or, or I'm really happy to answer everything. <laughs> Um, but is there is there any impacts with like gluten and gluten sensitivity with this perennial crop? Is there any different changes? Um, um, so yeah, it does have more protein, but when we speak of protein, the quality of protein matters. So it's not gluten free, but it's not able to form those networks because the brand kind of interferes and meddles with it. So it is not gluten free from a marketing point, but it can be very functional if you use the right processing methods. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, so yeah, let's have Henry go next. Um, I'll pull up his slides. Um, just as a quick reminder, presentations are three to five minutes and we'll have judge questions directly after for three to five minutes as well.
All right, Henry, go ahead whenever you're ready. Hello. All right. Hi. Um, my name is Henry Parento. Um, I'm a sophomore studying computer science with a minor in mathematics in the computer uh, in the College of Science and Engineering. Um, I am presenting today on uh, encouraging local action uh, for a sustainable future. Um, what my presentation is going to focus on is why local action is important and then show some examples um, of where this has been put into place um, and where uh, we should be implementing this. So um, just a brief overview on why I think uh, local action is so important in our uh, fight against climate change. Um, firstly, uh, if you're trying to influence uh, leaders at a higher level of government, federal, sometimes state, um, they can, if they disagree with you or they are too slow to action, this can uh, be a hindrance to you. And additionally, um, it is difficult to get in contact with them uh, and actually have a real influence on those leaders. Whereas with local action, we can directly communicate with those in power and have a real uh, chance to influence um, what they're doing. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, speaking first on uh, Zabek, which is a small city of about 7,000 in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. Um, I visited there over uh, over winter break with a study abroad group um, and some things about them. They are able to produce 400% of the energy that they need through a uh, full decade effort put forward by their mayor, Wilfred um, Ross, and the Klima Kommune, which means Climate Community uh, Project Manager, Guido Walrath. Um, they funded this entire project um, with from people and companies within Zabe. Um, and this project has allowed them to uh, expand economically. Uh, after they have implemented this, they have seen a number of companies uh, actually want to come into their community. Um, additionally, um, it has brought in ecotourism. People are coming to see their um, uh, bioenergy park where they produce most of this energy. Um, so uh, let's go to the uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is a uh, graphic made by Guido Ralraven and his um, group in Zabek. It is a visual representation of the projects that they are implementing in their community um, in a way that really shows, uh, is able to communicate with people why these, how these things are uh, intertwined um, in the fashion of a train map. Um, so we have uh, some of these paths are directly related to um, energy ecotourism, or we have a path directly related to their bioenergy park. Um, and on the outside, we have the smaller parts of that individual project and how those stand on their own. But once we get closer to the middle where we have these larger white spots, uh, those are like stations um, where all of these projects come together under one main project. Um, and next slide, please. Finally, um, why, what I want to do with this knowledge of why local action is important and learning from what Zabek has done is try to implement this kind of thinking and um, action on the Iron Range of Northeastern Minnesota, 
where I live. Um, politically, we lean, we have historically leaned to the left, thanks to a strong union background. Um, this is slowly changing, um, thanks to um, the region being more socially conservative. Um, and the uh, iron mines slowly uh, going down in um, viability. So what the region could benefit from is uh, more um, investment into, uh, into renewable energy uh, practices. Um, this would provide stability through diversification. Um, additionally, more of an environmental reason as to why the Iron Range should do this. We are surrounded by pristine wilderness and we are on the footstep to the boundary waters and therefore we have a sort of responsibility to be a steward to this. And I think that's everything. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Henry. We'll go on to judge questions for three to five minutes now. Okay. Henry, do you have suggestions for diversification for the Iron Range? Yeah, um, so one project that has already begun is a solar panel manufacturing plant that was put up in Mount Nair. Um, it has um, been running kind of on and off for the past decade. Um, we can continue that. Um, other than that, I see um, many possibilities in uh, some battery-based uh, investment uh, and where this would tie into the iron range is since we have this strong mining um, resource and background, we simply take, I mean, we can take that, um, the, those resources and kind of fund that or use that in our manufacturing. And how that would work exactly, I'm not sure, but it would be a step. All right, I have another question if nobody else does. Um, with the, the open pits, I'm also from the Iron Range. Um, mm -hmm. Does, I know Germany has mines as well, but I don't know if they've done any open pit mines. And I, I'm curious if they have any reclamation uses for examples um, that we could potentially reclaim some of our old mine areas that are not being used anymore. Yeah. Um, so here, uh, those most of the very old ones just um, are converted into uh, pits or fishing pits. Uh, the water, it gets filled with water just naturally. Um, and then fish are stocked there and we can um, use that as a recreational resource to go fishing. Um, in addition to uh, just um, increasing habitat for other species that want wetlands. Um, I'm not sure what, is being, what has been done in Germany um, with their open pit mines and reclamation with that, but uh, that is what I've seen done on the Iron Range. Thank you. So we are going to move on to our last presentation. Um, we have Noah talking about um, environmentalism related to aerospace. Um, so just a minute here. Uh, thank you, everyone. I apologize a little bit for the change in scheduling. However, I'm here already. So give me one second. OK, it's loading just one moment. Your screen. Okay. 
Okay, can you t can you see it? Yes. Yep. Okay, perfect. So let's start once again. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Nava San. I'm a second year student studying aerospace engineering. And I would like to provide an overview of the feasibility and attainability of creating an environmental aerospace. Okay, perfect. So within the field of aerospace, um, you can have to take a look into the transportation industry. So as of right now, within the US in transportation, aeros the aerospace industry is a low contributor in greenhouse gas emissions. For example, commercial aircraft accounts for 2.4% of overall CO2 emissions within the United States and other types of aerospace um, vehicles such as from military and spacecraft, either from governments such as NASA or private such as SpaceX or Blue Origin, account for 1.1%. However, due to the increase in efficiency and also in um, feasibility to attain high, like lower prices for aircraft, commercial aircraft, there has been a 70% faster increase in the amount of emissions due to the aerospace industry amounting to uh, 900 million megatons in 2018. So therefore, the aviation industry has been aware of these emissions and now is committed to some intended goals, such as for the short term, a yearly 2.3% increase in fuel efficiency, but also to the long term contribute to a 50% reduction in CO2 emissions by 2050. However, as you can see in here, there has, you can have like an overview of how this trend is beginning to increase as the years go by and commercial aircraft becomes much, much more uh, popular within the cost, within their customers. And with tech improvements and also with air traffic management improvements, it's relatively, um, it can be seen that it cannot be attainable to have a major reduction in CO2 emissions. However, there's this, this green area that is also a key factor so that the reduction of CO2 emissions can be reached. And that one is the use of alternative fuels. As, of, as, seen, as you can see here, there's a trend that if we use 100% of sustainable aviation fuels, it can be reduced all the way up to less than 500 net 3.6 CO2 emissions from international aviation according to the International Civil Aviation Organization. So for me, one of the contributions that I think could be attainable is the use of algal biofuels, one that has been made, for example, by ExxonMobil over the last uh, 10 years with an investment of $2.250 million. Their target as of right now is to have 1,500 gallons per acre per year. And according to um, a NASA report, it was um, claimed that 50% of this biofuel mixture could contribute to 50 or even 70% reduction in air traffic pollution. The goal with this is to have a production that is more affordable, sustainable, and scalable so that you can use it not only for aviation, but rather to different sectors within transportation and have a huge reduction from the 20% that we have right now to around um, 10 to even 6%. In terms of feasibility and benefits, you have a bunch of different factors. In turn, for it would require um, high amounts of investments in fertilizers and also water storage facilities, such as open ponds, which are these small ponds that would allow algae to grow, and also significant improvements in genetic engineering for algae. Because what different industries have done so far is to genetically engineer this algae so that they have a higher concentration in lipids. And these lipids are the ones that contribute to having better amounts of biofuel. 
then um, chat two minute remaining. Okay, perfect. Hold up, what, ha what happened? Uh, sorry about that. And then uh, in terms of benefits, of algae compared to other types of biofuels is that it has a widespread use of different in different types of water. You can use it in salt water and also in a combination of normal water combined with salty water. Um, and while it grows, algae's CO2, algae's consume CO2 and consume CO2 and therefore has a low profile in CO, in CO2 emissions compared to other biofuels. And it can yield a higher um, biofuel concentration than other plant-based biofuels. For mass production, since I mentioned before, um, genetic engineering for this type of biofuels is the key factor because depending on the con concentration of lipids, you can have different types of um, like refinement for each type of sector. For example, you can have one for the aviation industry, one for, um, for trucks, and one for cars. And it's similar just as it would be for the aviation and for um, cars, planes, and even rockets. Because kerosene is a, yeah, because rocket fuel is a highly refined version of uh, airplane fuel, which is a highly concentrated um, refinement of um, regular fuel used in cars. So therefore, I believe that this can be a feasible way that we can use biofuels in the future and contribute to a better um, and more sustainable aerospace within not only Minnesota, but also within other sectors in the world. Thank you. Awesome, so we'll do three to five minutes for judge questions now. That last slide mentioned that you'd need to have a lot of open ponds in order to, to grow the algae. Um, would it need to be clean fresh water or thinking about, you know, a presentation we heard earlier, would you be able to use wastewater from another um, facility that already has ponds in existence? It can be used within different, um, it can be used within different types of waters, um, prefer, preferably of course ones that are relatively clean, but like if you were to use salt water, which is an environment where algae mostly grows, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have like a significant effect on that. Um, there will have to be, um, I would have to have a little bit more research on the effects that like how the con concentration of dirtier water has regarding um, like the efficiency within for biofuels to have like different, like different concentrations for um, the amount, like how efficient it can be depending on the cleanliness of the water. However, depending on the solid, for example, salinity, it wouldn't have a significant problem. Okay, another question that I have here is, in addition to reducing air pollution, what are the benefits of adopting this type of biofuel to airlines and other companies? Could it be less expensive, easier to get? As of right now, the visa is still on a developmental stage and has been for the past 10 years. However, multiple companies such as um, Genet Genetic Synthetics and also ExxonMobil have claimed that by within 15 to 25 years, it could be uh, attainable, not only within the aviation industry, but also different um, sectors of transportation. Of course, there will be a lot, there, there has to be, um, there has to be a lot of economic incentives as well to apply this new one and also to know, to provide benefits so that they, so that the different transportation industries know that this type of biofuel can be more feasible and even more 
um, efficient in terms of compared to the regular fuel that we have now. In terms of getting it easier to get, um, since right now where it is on the developmental process, there would still be a bunch of, um, like it would require some more development so that it can be produced on a larger scale. Because for example, it would require about 10,000 gallons per se, so that it could not only be for the aviation industry, but also the entire mar market of transportation. So regarding that, like it can, all, you can have, uh, it will require some time, but like I'm purely optimistic that it can be done. Would this have to be, um, just thinking about our winters and your ponds would freeze, would it have to be something that's grown in a temperate region? It can also be grown within the temperate region. Of course, you can you would require to have like a different environment so that it can grow. But like you, um, so you have locations where it can. There have been locations where it can be built on, like it can be grown, not only with it, with sunlight but also in a, like in a research lab. And since right now they're looking at different ways of how to do it, um, like you can. I w don't want to say that it can be assumed, but it is being right now tested so that it can be um, used within different environments so that it can work not only in warm conditions, but also in cold conditions so that it can have the same amount of efficiency in every single case. All right, thanks so much, Noah. Um, so that is the end of our presentations for session two. Um, I want to again thank the judges so much for your time commitment and your thoughtful questions um, and for joining us today for these sessions. Um, so we're going to tally up everyone's scores and um, awards will be announced in this room, room one, this Z link, um, at 3.30 p.m. Um, for now, we'll have a, about a 25-30 minute break um, at 2.15 in this room. We're going to have a panel. Um, so brief break until then, and um, see you guys again at 2.15. Thank you.